Good evening. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Um, my name is Greta Kenny. I serve as Senior Associate Dean of Students, and I have the pleasure of representing Cornell University. On behalf of the university, I wish to remind all participants that Cornell values free and open inquiry and expression and strives to create a community where diverse opinions can be expressed and heard. As provided in university policy, the speaker has a right to speak without intimidation and the audience has a right to hear what the speaker has to say. Audience members who disagree with the speaker may make their views known so long as they do not interfere with the speaker's ability to be heard or the right of others to listen and see the speaker. Actions that prevent a speaker's ability to be heard or the right of others to listen and see are in violation of university policy and may be referred to the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards or other appropriate officials. To most fully protect the free expression of rights of speakers and protesters alike, anyone who unduly interferes with the program will be warned, and if the interference continues, the responsible individuals will be asked to leave. Thank you. Hello, Cornell. My name is Bob Platt, and I've been defending free speech at Cornell ever since I was a student 50 years ago. To defend free speech meaningfully, you have to be ready to stand up to threats on both the left and right. Today, FIRE does that better than any other group. That is why it is so important to bring Nico Perino to talk to campus along with our co-sponsors, the Cornell Review, the Cornell Political Union, Cornell Undergraduate Veterans Association, and the College Republicans. Let's thank them. Nico is Executive Vice President of FIRE and host to the So To Speak podcast. Nico graduated from Indiana University Bloomington with a bachelor's degree in journalism and history. While at IU, he was a member of the track and field team and served as editor-in-chief for the Indiana Standard and as a reporter and columnist for the Indiana Daily Student. Originally from Chicago, Nico now lives and works in the Washington, D.C. area. Let's give Nico a round of applause. Thanks, Bob. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of our co-sponsors for having me here today. This is my first time in Ithaca and I had my first interaction with the Hills when I decided to walk from downtown. But I'm, the good news is I'll be walking downhill on the way back. So, I want to start my talk today um, just with my story, uh, how I came to become interested in free expression issues. Uh, it really goes back to the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, my name's Nico Perino, so as you might imagine, I grew up in an Italian Catholic family, uh, going to church every Sunday, uh, Sunday school all the way up through confirmation in eighth grade. Uh, I had a, one Sunday school teacher who promised us McDonald's if we went to uh, church during the weekday. And so I would do that periodically and get the free McDonald's afterward. But it was after I was confirmed in maybe uh, my freshman, sophomore year of high school that I started to have second thoughts uh, about my faith. Uh, this was around the time uh, that the four horsemen were prominent in public discourse. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with them, uh, Sam Harris, he's got a famous podcast now, uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins uh, were the four horsemen. They had written books like The God Delusion and God is Not Great. And I started to become interested in the ideas uh, that they were espousing. Uh, they weren't just atheists. They described themselves in some cases as anti-theists, so anti-religion. And I had come across this documentary called Collision which was a series, a film series of debates between Christopher Hitchens and this guy, Douglas Wilson, who is a fundamentalist pastor from Idaho. And I remember being fascinated by this documentary. So here on the one hand, you had Christopher Hitchens who had this commanding knowledge of the Bible, of the Quran, uh, and came to 
one sort of conclusion about it, right? Ultimately, the anti-theist conclusion. And you had this other guy, Douglas Wilson, who uh, also had a commanding knowledge of scripture, but came to the completely opposite conclusion about it. And they toured the country, all parts of the country, cities, rural areas, debating these issues. They weren't afraid to debate each other on these issues. Uh, and I remember just how much they learned from each other. Christopher Hitchens would throw out from memory one line of scripture and Douglas Wilson would throw out another line seemingly to repute Hitchens. And then Hitchens would come back with another one. And I just remember how much smarter I felt after watching those two debate, this idea that steel sharpens steel. Some of you, if you're familiar with kind of free speech philosophy, will be familiar with John Stuart Mill, who was a 19th century English philosopher who in 1859 wrote the book on liberty, which lays out a series of arguments for free expression. And he talks about how there are, we can really kind of only settle on three things. How we, we can only be right right? We could be wrong or we could be partially right. But in all of those cases, it argues towards free expression. If you're right, then you have a greater conception of your truth through its confrontation with error. If you're wrong, then you trade your error for truth. And if you're partially right, you might get a greater conception of the truth through confrontation with someone else who must, might be partially right. And you saw that come through in Christopher Hitchens' debates with Douglas Wilson. Now, fast forward to uh, Indiana University. I joined the Secular Student Alliance, uh, as one does when they get on campus and get super excited when they go to the student activities fair and see all the groups that uh, sort of speak to them. Uh, and it was a fun experience because we would invite people from across the ideological spectrum to come and debate the issues, not just people, not just atheists, um, but believers, true believers. And we would come and we would have it out with them uh, and learn from them. It was my senior year of uh, college when Christopher Hitchens died. Uh, I believe it was in December of 2011. Uh, and the following spring, a separate group on campus, um, a Christian group, decided they were going to invite Douglas Wilson to campus. And as you might imagine, I was stoked. Here he, here he comes, this is my opportunity to play Christopher Hitchens, to debate Douglas Wilson in the Q&A session that would follow his speech. But no sooner had Douglas Wilson started, um, they, well, no sooner had the group started to promote Douglas Wilson's speech, uh, than I knew something wasn't gonna be right about it. Uh, you started hearing rumblings from certain student groups that they didn't want Douglas Wilson to come to campus. They were petitioning the administration to prevent him from stepping foot on campus because of some of his fundamentalist beliefs on uh, LGBT rights and other issues. I arrived in the auditorium to a packed house and no sooner had Douglas Wilson started speaking than the noises started to come across. Uh, banging on the doors, um, blow horns, uh, pulling of fire alarms, uh, signs held up. No, the, it was clear that the, the protesters didn't want him to speak and were not going to let him speak. Now, to Indiana University's credit, they did everything that they could to try and uh, ameliorate the disruptions, but you can only play whack-a-mole so long um, before the event has been effectively shut down. Uh, and that's what happened. I never got the opportunity to have my Christopher Hitchens moment with Douglas Wilson, because there were other students, unfortunately, my peers, who decided that I wasn't going to have that opportunity, that they had decided for themselves that what Douglas Wilson said was wrong and there was nothing to be learned from it, and therefore I wasn't going to have the opportunity to engage him. Douglas, uh, John Stuart Mill uh, wrote in On Liberty that to refuse a hearing to an opinion because that you are sure that it is false is to assume that your certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. And that's what those protesters did that day. They assumed that their certainty was the same as absolute certainty to hell with what anyone else thought or what anyone else wanted to learn or how anyone else wanted to engage. They weren't gonna let you. Um, there's a danger in that. When you hold your opinions and don't allow the confrontation and error, you start to hold your opinions as a dead dogma, as a prejudice. Uh, 
Mill talks about how both teachers and learners go to sleep when there's no enemy in the field. Before Wilson was shut down, he said one thing that really resonated with me uh, and still resonates with me to this day. He said to the protesters, I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. And reflecting on that, I said, isn't that the purpose of college, right? We come into college oftentimes with strong convictions, but we hold them loosely. We take seriously the possibility that we might be wrong. We have epistemic humility. So I came there to teach Douglas Wilson a lesson that day, but he taught me one. He taught me what the purpose of college is, even if I disagreed with everything else that he was gonna say that night. Now, I know uh, my friends here at Cornell are familiar with these sort of attempts to shut down speakers. Uh, in November, you had the incident with Ann Coulter. Uh, I won't recount that story. I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with it. But one thing that struck me uh, about that incident was the one protester, one heckler who stood up and said, we don't want you to speak here. Your words are violence. This is an argument that's been around for a long time, uh, that words are violence, although it seems to have gained greater cachet today. Um, you didn't hear it as much back when I was in college as you do today, though it existed. And to me, this is one of the more dangerous arguments that exists, because in societies, in our communities, there are two ways to solve our disputes. You can do it the way we did for millennia, which is through violence right? Might makes right. Or you can do it with our words, which is the fundamental premise on which democracy is based. That we have it out, that we debate our issues, and we ultimately come to a conclusion on how to move forward. Sigmund Freud once said that civilization was founded the first time a man cast a word instead of a stone. If we start to conflate words with violence, Logic dictates that we can then use violence in response to words. The argument goes, and there was this uh, professor who made this argument in the Atlantic that uh, my boss, uh, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, an NYU professor responded to who said, well, words can create stress and prolonged stress can create uh, physical sort of maladies, uh, can have a deleterious effect on one's health. But if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, right? Then an argument with your spouse, an argument with my wife that goes on for a period of time could be violence. An argument uh, with my work colleagues or a disagreement with my work colleagues that creates stress is violence. We need to have a bright line between words on one hand, which is how we can solve our disputes, and violence on the other. Get rid of that line and democracy goes out the door. Civil discourse goes out the door. The whole college experience goes out the door. Now, there are some who argue that shouting down speakers is uh, itself a, a form of free expression. And I reject this fundamentally. Um, in fact, I'm not alone in rejecting this premise. Uh, way back in the 19th century, I'm traveling back to the 19th century a lot today. Um, I promise I'll bring it to present day here at the end. Uh, Frederick Douglass, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, the great abolitionist and former slave, uh, was set to hold a abolitionist meeting in Boston. Uh, and the group convened and, and they were set upon by a pro-slavery mob. Uh, the mob did what happened at Douglas Wilson's uh, speech, did what happened in part here at, at um, Ann Coulter's speech. They shouted down Frederick Douglass and the pro-abolitionist uh, speakers. And Frederick Douglass, later that year in 1860, wrote one of his uh, famous essays called The Plea for Free Speech in Boston, in which he wrote to, so he wrote to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer, as well as those of the speaker. Frederick Douglass was one of the most articulate and erudite uh, advocates for freedom of expression. He went so far in that very essay to say that if that slavery cannot tolerate free speech, he believed that five years of free speech exercise would banish the auction block and break every chain in the South. 
because he had seen what had happened in his day and age where abolitionists weren't allowed to make their arguments. In fact, you couldn't even make abolitionist arguments on the floors of Congress for a period of time. He called, he called free speech the dread of tyrants. He understood that when you are powerless, sometimes the only tool that you have is your voice and that it must be free to make your arguments. There's, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, you know, book bans have come back into trend, uh, unfortunately, across the United States. FIRE has long been a co-sponsor of Ban Books Week, which takes place, I believe, in September of every year. And it became kind of an anachronism, right? We don't ban books anymore. So at a certain point, we changed the messaging around banned books. It wasn't just banned books anymore. It was banned and challenged books. Uh, but this past year, it was, was really no longer an anachronism. Uh, there are efforts in state legislatures across the country to ban books, even to jail librarians. Uh, for distributing certain books. And I, and I have to wonder, uh, you know, we all, I think, kind of have an intuitive sense that book banning is wrong because we've seen what's happened in the past uh, when people didn't like ideas. They burned books. They, they built pyres. Which they tossed the books in. We saw this happen in Nazi Germany. But I wonder why the same sort of prejudice against book banning doesn't exist for speaker bans or for shouting down speakers, right? The animus is the same. It's the desire to prevent a willing audience from hearing a message because you don't like what that message says. Sure, it might not be the written word on a page, but it's words coming out of a mouth that you're trying to prevent someone else from hearing. And because there's been a resurgence in the rise of book banning and a resurgence in the rise of uh, censorship, quite frankly, I have to wonder what to make of America's current free speech culture. Uh, you can often kind of judge a culture by the idioms that it adopts. Uh, my boss, Greg Lukianoff, likes to talk about when he was a kid, and, and frankly, when I was a kid, you heard phrases like, it's a free And what transpired that I think is the perfect example of why text. On Milo Yiannopoulos at Berkeley, but Milo Yiannopoulos was on cable news and network news all night as a result of that effort to censor. His book shot up to number one on Amazon's charts. This is called the Streisand effect. Uh, Barbara Streisand, of course, the famous singer, uh, had a Malibu home. She might still have the Malibu home for all I know. Uh, but there was this gentleman who was documenting coastal erosion along the coast of California uh, with photographs over time, hoping to show what was happening with the coastal erosion. And Barbara Streisand somehow found out that her home was in one of the shots and decided to file a lawsuit against the man to get the photo taken down. The photo, I, I think, according to court records, had something like 12 views on it at the time. She files her lawsuit, it gets reported on, as those things do, right? Something like 400,000 people had visited that photo as a result of that lawsuit. And so since then, this has become known as the Streisand effect. Efforts to censor often create a greater platform 
greater visibility for the views or messages that the sensor is trying to censor. So it's just plain bad tactics often to do it. It also short circuits your, your knowledge, your ability to understand the world. Uh, there's one theory of free expression that people don't often give enough credence, which is the pure informational theory of free expression that uh, my boss, Greg Lukianoff, talks about a lot and we talk about at FIRE, which is, he calls it the small T truth, that it's important to know the world as it actually is. Right to sensor is it's like breaking a thermometer. You might not know what the temperature is anymore, but that doesn't change the temperature. Greg likes to say it's like taking Xanax for your syphilis. You might feel a little bit better, but it's not going to do away with your syphilis, right? And so, if you're someone who disagrees with an idea or holds certain beliefs close to your vest, you want to know who the people out there are who disagree with you, what the arguments are that they're making. Again, to go back to Douglas Wilson and Christopher Hitchens, steel sharpens steel, right? Engage with them. Bernie Sanders, I believe, said this in a debate um, when he, he was asked if so-and-so should be sensitive. He's like, what am I afraid of, their ideas? He wants to have it out with them. And I think that's exactly right. Another trend that sort of concerns me is the de facto rejection of the Berkeley free speech movement. Now, what's the Berkeley free speech movement? It was a movement that was began at the University of California, Berkeley in, in uh, 1964, effort by students to essentially throw off uh, that school's speech codes and policies at that school in, that had in place effectively in loco parentis, this idea of in place of parents, that colleges are responsible for being your parents while you're on campus. We forget, but for many years, actually for most of American history, you had curfews. Uh, men couldn't reside in the, same in the same dormitories as women. You had certain dress codes. You could only wear your hair a certain way. Um, but this was the 60s, right? Berkeley students wanted to you know, be the adults that they were uh, and exercise their own agency and their own autonomy on campus. You know, fast forward a, a decade or so and you get Pink Floyd's uh, another brick in the wall, right? We don't need no thought control teachers, leave the kids alone. Well, what you're seeing that you've seen in the past decade is not the administrators get off my back ethos. It's the come here, help me. These words are violence. These words are dangerous. We need to police them. You had Zionist students in uh, a couple decades ago who petitioned the student unions in England for a hate speech code. Uh, they were successful in doing so. And a few years later, they themselves were censored because Zionism was then seen as a form of racism, right? When you give third parties control over your lives, you have to be concerned at how they are gonna exercise that, right? Uh, now, Christopher Hitchens uh, once gave a speech in Canada where he turned to the audience and I think he made an effective rhetorical tactic. He said, he asked the audience, who would you decide? Who would you appoint with the authority to determine for you what books you can read? For you, what music you can listen to? For you, what art you can see or speakers you can hear? I don't know about you guys, but there's not a person in the world with, with whom I would trust that authority, right? Now, maybe you would have trust Barack Obama with that authority today. Four years later, you get Donald Trump. Would you trust him? That is the, the implicit belief by those who call for censorship and speech codes that the person in authority is always going to be on their side, right? That they're going to exercise it judiciously and always in their favor. The Berkeley Free Speech Movement. The students of the 60s who tried to throw off in a local parentis, and I've spoken to some of them, understood that, that that sort of authority should not be trusted. I want to take a step back now because one argument that you sometimes get is that, well, you're defending free speech rights for Nazis if you're the ACLU defending the rights of neo-Nazis to march in Skokie, Illinois in, in 1978. I made a documentary about uh, the case, uh, a case that was uh, defended mostly by Jewish lawyers uh, at the ACLU, David Goldberger, Aryeh Nair, uh, 
Ira Glasser, he's not a lawyer, but he became the executive director of the ACLU at the end of that case. Uh, Arye Nair himself was a Holocaust survivor. The argument that they would sometimes get on the other side was, well, okay, you allow these people free speech, then they come into power and they take away your free speech rights. It's too dangerous. We can't let them do that. Well, I think there's a power in these sort of small L liberal ideas like freedom of expression. I want to tell a story. Uh, is anyone familiar with a man by the name of Majid Nawaz? Bit of a public end. Yeah, okay. Um, he is a British citizen of Pakistani descent. And in his youth, he became involved with the Islamic Liberation Party, which is a international fundamentalist movement that campaigns for the reestablishment of a Muslim caliphate. Uh, it's a political party that's banned, or at least at the time um, that Majid was growing up in, in Egypt, uh, banned in England. And Majid had traveled to Egypt and was detained as a result of his involvement with uh, this political party. He was detained for 12 weeks by Cairo State Security Intelligence Agency in, the, in their intelligence build, building, and ultimately detained for many years. Amnesty International in the fall of 2002 decided to pay a visit to Majid Nawaz, who was not himself accused of any crime um, besides being a member of a political party. Uh, and they had decided because of this that they were going to take him up as a prisoner of conscience case uh, in prison for his political beliefs. Uh, at this point, Majid had been abandoned by his colleagues in the Islamic Liberation Party. They didn't want anything to do with the man who had been thrown in prison, right? Majid later wrote this. I was just amazed. We'd always seen amnesty as the soft power tools of colonialism. So when amnesty, despite knowing that we hated them, adopted us, I felt maybe these democratic values aren't always hypocritical. Maybe some people take them seriously. It was the beginning of my serious doubts. In March 2004, um, Amnesty International finally was successful in getting Majid Nawad released. And he has since shed his fundamentalist beliefs and come to the side of freedom of expression and liberalism as a result of what he saw Amnesty International do. They threw the power of demonstration, demonstrated that they weren't the sort of people that he and his, his peers in the Islamic Liberation Party thought they were. So what's the moral of the story? That there is a fundamental power in principle. I think I hear from a lot of uh, people who are skeptical of my arguments. Um, and they're skeptical in part because of what they see as the perceived hypocrisy of many free speech art, uh, advocates. I won't disagree that there are hypocritical free speech advocates out there. I mean, there's hypocritical advocates for every ideological position under the sun, right? But when they see, for example, uh, Republican legislators in, in Florida pass what in Fire's estimation was a very good intellectual freedom uh, and free speech bill, in the state of Florida, I believe it was in 2019, and then turn around a couple of years later and pass the Stop Woke Act, which prohibits teaching eight different subjects uh, in college classrooms. They might raise their eyebrows when free speech advocates make their arguments, right? These people are just a bunch of hypocrites, right? They, they say they care about free expression one year, and then the next they go and pass a law that undercuts the arguments that they had just made. Now, Fire had sued uh, the state of Florida over the Stop Woke Act uh, at the end of last year and got an injunction. Uh, so it's not in effect right now. But that sort of political expediency or privileging of political expediency over principle undercuts and does damage to the arguments for free expression, not just in the short term, but in the long run. John Stewart, uh, the comedian from The Daily Show, uh, one said, if you don't stick to your values when they're being tested, they're not values, they're hobbies. Freedom of expression 
uh, as Ira Glasser, the former executive director of the ACLU once said, it um, is like an insurance policy. He uses this analogy. He talks about poison gas. Poison gas is a very effective and powerful tool. Uh, as we learned during World War I, when the wind is in, at your back and the enemy is in your crosshairs. But the wind has a way of shifting, right? And that tool that you could use to go after your ideological enemies one day could very shortly thereafter be, go, uh, be used to go after you. There's a famous scene in Robert Bolt's famous play, A Man for All Seasons. Is anyone familiar with, with this play? A couple of you. Yeah, they made a movie out of it. Uh, it's about Sir Thomas More, his ultimate execution. Uh, but there is this one scene where Thomas More, who has um, law enforcement power within England, uh, is approached by his son-in-law, William Roper, and his, his daughter uh, about a man that they want Sir Thomas More to arrest. They go to him and they say, Dad, this man's dangerous. He's a liar. Father, the man is bad. And Sir Thomas More, he looks at, he looks at them and he says, were he the devil himself, I would not arrest him until he broke the law. And William Roper turns to him and says, so now you'd give the devil the benefit of the law? Yes, he said. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? William Roper says, well, yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Oh, says Moore. And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. The country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God. And if you cut them down, you're just the man to do it. Do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, Moore says, I give the devil the benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. I want to talk a little bit now about the role of a university. I talked about it a little bit at the top, right? Douglas Wilson's articulation that I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. That we come into college and universities with strong convictions, loosely held, with the idea that at any point we might be wrong and that we're willing to trade our falsity or our truth for a greater conception of the truth. Um, Jonathan Haidt, uh, who is the co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind with my boss, Greg, uh, and is an NYU professor, uh, calls this the telos of a university. Telos means the end or the goal or purpose for which an actor is done or a university or institution established, right? The telos of a knife is to cut, the telos of medicine is to heal, and the telos of a university is truth. Now, don't get me wrong, universities, colleges can have many goals. You know, they can want to establish fiscal health, they can want to have successful sports teams, uh, they can want to have a beautiful campus, right? But they can only have one telos. An institution can only rotate on one axis. And if it tries to elevate a second goal to that same level as that telos, it's like trying to rotate on two axes. It's impossible. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the situation that just occurred at Hamlin University in Minnesota. Hands, anyone? This adjunct professor, Erica Lopez Prater, was teaching a, a global survey of art history. And one of the lessons was on Islamic art history. And during this lesson, she was gonna show a 14th century Persian masterpiece painting uh, that depicted the Islamic prophet Muhammad, which in some teachings of Islam uh, is forbidden, forbidden from looking upon, but not in all and obviously not for this um, Muslim man who painted this 14th century masterpiece. Now, uh, Professor Prater, Lopez Prater, understanding of course that this would uh, cut against some people's kind of fundamental belief, she issued a warning on her syllabus and prior to the lesson said, we'll be showing this painting and if any of you wanna step out while I'm doing so, I'd be happy to oblige that and let you know when you can come back in. So she goes on with her lesson and afterward, a Muslim student complains to the administration. Uh, the studer, student later said at a forum that was hosted on campus that she felt like this can't be real. 
Who do I call at 8 a.m. when you see someone disrespecting and offending your religion? She had the warning. Uh, she decided to stick around and then complain about it. It's sort of like the story that uh, Hitchens tells about Samuel Johnson, the famous lexicographer man who first uh, wrote the first English language dictionary. After he did so, he was visited upon uh, by uh, the women nobility in London. And they come to Dr. Johnson, they say, Dr. Johnson, we wanna commend you on your dictionary. We wanna especially commend you on not using any vulgar words in the dictionary. Dr. Johnson turns to them and says, I wanna commend you on knowing where to look. You have to wonder if that student was looking to be offended after having every opportunity to not see the painting. Now the administration decided that they were gonna punish this faculty member for showing the painting. They said, respect for the observant Muslim students in that classroom should have, been, should have superseded academic freedom, calling the lesson itself Islamist, Islamophobic. They later held that forum when the student made those comments that I shared with you all. When a, a representative from Cara, Minnesota said, if somebody wants to teach some controversial stuff about Islam, go teach it at the local library as if college isn't the sort of place where you teach these sort of things. Now, often colleges and universities will host these sorts of forums. I put them in quotation marks because they're not forums for conversation as they're often billed. Uh, they're essentially therapy sessions. And if you read the New York Times reporting on this incident in Hamlin, you really see that. Uh, Mark Berkson is the chair of the religious studies department at Hamlin. And during the forum, he asked a question. He said, well, how, should, how are we supposed to think about this issue when there are some traditions within Islam that don't see depictions of the Prophet Muhammad as blasphemous? And this is what the New York Times reporting says. Uh, Dr. Berkson was approached separately after he asked his question by the department head and an administrator who put their hands on his shoulder and says, this was not the time to raise these concerns. This is a therapy session. This isn't an opportunity for debate and discussion. Now, I should add that the university itself was roundly criticized. While a representative from CARE Minnesota came out and supported the university's position to punish this professor, CARE National did not, recognizing that the professor gave a content warning and allowed those who wanted to opt out to opt out, recognizing also that this is a sort of doctrinal dispute within uh, the religion itself. Uh, the faculty came to the defense of uh, Professor Erica Lopez Prater, voting 72 to 12 last month, uh, no confidence in the university president. And the Board of Trustees later rebuked the email that was sent by uh, the president calling the teaching Islamophobic, saying that uh, respect for the student's Muslim beliefs, Islamic beliefs, should have superseded ac academic freedom. And I bring this up, right, because this is a university that's trying to spin on two axes. It's trying to elevate religion and religious sensitivities above principles of academic freedom. And sometimes those are going to come into conflict when you're taking harsh looks or even just looks at issues from all different directions. I really love Cornell's mission statement, it speaks to its telos. Cornell's mission is to discover, preserve, and disseminate knowledge, to educate the next generation of global citizens, and to promote a culture of broad inquiry throughout and beyond the Cornell community. When I went to the mission page at Cornell, those were the first words that were printed on that mission page. They're reflective of, word, of the mission statement at the University of Chicago as well, which has taken on a leadership position on free expression issues. So I wanna end by just talking about what universities like Cornell can do to stand up for these values. Well, one thing you can do is pre-commit the freedom of expression, just as Cornell did in its mission statement, right? But it's not just enough to have those words on a page. They need to effuse the educational experience. You need to recommit to them. Messages need to be shared throughout 
a student's educational experience, just like um, was done here before I started speaking, uh, and campus-wide communications and orientation programming. Uh, and I don't know if you guys do community reads uh, here. I know Princeton does. Uh, they assigned a, a book written by Professor Keith Whittington over there uh, on free expression in campus. Uh, colleges can also seek to understand kind of the culture for free expression and broad inquiry, to quote Cornell's mission statement on campus. Conduct surveys. Do students feel as though they can speak out on the issues that they care about? Or even just play devil's advocacy in the classroom. Articulate positions that they don't believe, but they want to hear others respond to so that they can understand their positions better. Or do they self-censor? And most importantly, defend the free speech rights of students and faculty loudly, clearly, and early. This is how colleges and universities get in trouble. They try to please everyone when a controversy inevitably arises, and they end up, as a result, pleasing no one. The best example of someone who, a college administrator who spoke up loudly, clearly, and early goes back to 2001, and by a, it was at the University of Alaska, a gentleman by the name of Mark Hamilton, used to be a high rank uh, in the United States military, coordinated peace negotiations in Africa and elsewhere. And at the time, this is 2001, so there were debates about around Anwar oil drilling in Alaska. Um, some faculty mem members wrote an open letter to the Clinton administration about the drilling that received pushback on campus. A, a faculty member, Professor Linda McCarriston, wrote a poem about uh, the indigenous population there in Alaska that received pushback. And Mark Hamilton and his chancellors at all the various system schools at the University of Alaska was under intense pressure to do something to punish these faculty members that wrote this open letter to Bill Clinton, to punish this faculty member who wrote this poem. And so he decided he was gonna send a system-wide email. And this is what the email said, and it's worth reading in full. What I wanna make clear and unambiguous is that responses to complaints or demands for action regarding constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech cannot be qualified cannot be qualified as in all caps, by the way, in this email. Attempts to assuage anger or to demonstrate concern by qualifying our support for free speech serve to cloud what must be a clear message. Noting that, for example, the university supports the right of free speech, but we intend to check into this matter, or the university supports the right of free speech, but I've asked Dean X or Provost Y to investigate the circumstances is unacceptable, he writes. There is nothing to quote check into, nothing to quote investigate. Opinions expressed by our employees, students, faculty, or administrators don't have to be politic or polite. However personally offended we might be, however unfair the association of the university to the opinion might be, I insist that we remain a certain trumpet on this most precious of constitutional rights. Fast forward. 18 years to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and Camille Paglia, is anyone familiar with Camille Paglia? Uh, she's a feminist um, scholar, kind of a contrarian one, um, has said some controversial things about the Me Too movement. There were demands to have her fired from the faculty. She was given a speech on campus and students pulled the fire alarm to prevent it from happening. And there, another university president, David Yeager, wrote a very similar email to Mark Hamilton. He said, across our nation, it is all too common that opinions expressed that differ from another's, especially those that are controversial, can't, can spark passion and even outrage, often resulting in calls to suppress the speech. He wrote, that simply cannot be allowed to happen. I firmly believe that limiting the rage of voices in society erodes our democracy. Universities, moreover, he writes, are at the heart of the revolutionary notion of free expression. Promoting the free exchange of ideas is part of the core reason for their existence. He writes, I believe this resolve holds even greater importance at an art school. Artists over the centuries have suffered censorship and even persecution for the expression of their beliefs through their work. My simple answer is not now, not at UArts. 
He writes that email, the demands for censorship and this heckler's vetoes and he nipped it in the bud. It was unequivocal. At UArts, we defend free and open expression, including artistic expression. So I would urge any administrators who might be watching this or sitting in the audience, when a censorship controversy does arise on campus, speak out loudly, clearly, and early for Cornell's mission statement, for Cornell's telos. So with that, I will leave it and uh, Hopefully there's an opportunity for, for some of you all to tell me why I'm wrong. Thank you. We have time for questions, I'm assuming, yes. right? Okay. And, and are people supposed to submit questions in the chat if they're uh, using the yeah, so we will now open up for questions. If you have a question, please just walk down to either me or Amand at the end of the row here. And people on Zoom, please feel free to send a message in the chat with your questions. Okay. If there are no questions, I can keep talking, but. Sure. The one person who knew who Maja now was. was. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, so I just, you mentioned that sometimes People who support uh, free speech can be hypocritical about it. Yep. Um, how would you recommend uh, avoiding being a hypocrite about free speech? What are some strategies you can use to kind of police yourself? Yeah, well, for fire, it's easy, right? Because we take cases. And all you need to do is go to our case archive and see that we take cases across the political and ideological uh, spectrum. Um, you know, if we didn't, we only took cases on one side of the political spectrum. Maybe the allegations of hypocrisy uh, would be warranted, but for you know the average concerned community member, uh, you know if you have a social media presence, speak out uh, when those with whom you disagree are censored, or when there are calls to censor those with whom you disagree. Um, you know you so, you, you sometimes we <laughs> it's it's become a meme at fire. Uh, whereby there are plenty of people out there on, particularly on social media, who like to tr try and catch us in a hypocrisy trap. Uh, it's called, where's fire on this? They like quote tweet a, a, a news article about a case of censorship, uh, thinking that fire isn't already on the case. And then we kind of respond to them with our tweet that we had put out maybe an hour earlier, condemning that act of censorship. Uh, so sometimes people just don't know how to use Google and there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but, you know, it requires speaking out loudly, clearly and early uh, when these sort of censorship institutes happen. Yeah. Oops. So when it comes to banning books, I certainly agree, whether it's on two very opposite sides of the spectrum, whether it's Mein Kampf as a historical piece or the books on you know, transgender children, which are, you know, on opposite sides of the yeah. spectrum, um, should be available for people to see. And because if it's available, then you can criticize it. Um, it's hard to criticize something if you can't, if you don't even know about it, which Correct. is a problem with banning books. But when it comes to, let's say, K through 12 schools, or maybe even public universities, these schools, you, I mean, students have to go to school. Um, so what in, and it, in terms of crafting the curriculum, yep. what would you say, you know, the people as a whole in a, in a democracy or a constitutional republic have um, in crafting that? Um, I'm really curriculum? glad you asked that question because, you know, in my brief treatment of book banning here, you're not able to get into all the, uh, the nuances around the different places where books exist, right? So let's talk about curriculum, right? To the extent that you have compulsory K through 12 education, um, you know, the community does have a say in what gets taught. Um, I don't think many people would countenance compulsory K through 12 education if the democratic process had nothing to say about uh, what gets taught. Um, so there is room for state involvement there, involvement from democratically elected school boards, for example. Now, you talk about K through 12 libraries, a uh, little bit more flexibility, right? Uh, there was a case in the 1990s called Pico, uh, which I think kind of, I think essentially got it right. Um, 
which said to the extent a, a university has a process for determining, determining what books, or a, excuse me, a school or a school board has a process for determining what books go in the library, uh, it can't circumvent that process uh, just because uh, they politically oppose some of the books that were chosen uh, and that were chosen in a way that abided by the process, right? Uh, so librarians are often given uh, pretty broad discretion to determine age appropriateness in the K through 12 environment. Um, rightfully so, right? Um, there are certain books that are just not appropriate for elementary school students or for middle school students. Um, you zoom back further out from that and you have public libraries, uh, which should be a repository for knowledge. Now, library, of course, these are not uh, uh, places where you, you don't have unlimited shelf space, right? So librarians often make determination what books go on those shelves. But um, what you find across the country is that there are many state legislators and some local law enforcement officials now that are, are arresting uh, librarians, in fact. Uh, there are efforts to put content warnings on library books, uh, uh, just in the same way they, there were efforts to put uh, content warnings on, on music and movies. Um, and these are the sort of book bans uh, that FIRE is most concerned about, the ones that happen in libraries. There are even efforts to get books uh, banned from bookstores in my home state of Virginia. Uh, there were two books. Virginia has this unique law that allows state legislators to, uh, to I think, sue a book uh, to prevent it from getting sold on the bookshelf. Um, and uh, someone on FIRE's advisory council, Bob Corn Revere, um, defended the booksellers uh, in court and that lawsuit and didn't end up going anywhere, but there was an effort to prevent the sale even uh, of books. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a cascading or it's kind of a ladder, right? Like when you're preventing books from being sold or attempting to prevent books from being sold in a bookstore, that's the most concerning all the way down to preventing certain books from being taught in the curriculum where in compulsory uh, K through 12 education, um, school boards have more authority. But in all those cases, they need to fall, follow established processes which is often not happening. They're just go doing an end run around and deciding that there are certain books that they don't wanna have, or they're writing broad and vague speech codes to prevent certain books from existing on the shelves. Uh, Keller Independent School District, for example, in Texas wrote a very vague speech code about what books can be on the shelves and, and ended up as a result prohibiting Anne Frank's diary. It's just kind of how absurd it can get in some cases. Does that answer your question? Thanks. It's going well. I wish I had a, a clear answer for you. Um, I guess the best answer I can give you is I'm not sure, right? Uh, you, can, you can ask it two ways, right? You can, say, you can ask it about the law. You think the future of First Amendment law is going to remain strong or get worse? Uh, and you can ask it about the culture. Um, I'm, well, I'll start with the culture. When I was on campus, a lot of the sort of trends surrounding censorship did not exist. Um, the word I said earlier, the words is violent argument was not violence argument. And I didn't hear very often uh, appeals to, you know, Microaggressions, for example, as a as an effort to censor didn't exist or trigger warnings, the sort of disinvitations that you see now, Douglas Wilson aside, weren't as prevalent. You weren't seeing people throw Molotov cocktails uh, in the campus quad like we saw over at Berkeley, uh, for example. So, you know, in that sense, I, I do wonder if if the culture is is getting worse. I think part of it is just a reflection of our hyperpolarized society. Um, and maybe social media uh, in a little way. But law is downstream from culture, right? And if, if folks become disenfranchised with the ideas uh, surrounding free expression, open inquiry, the ideas of the enlightenment, for example, you have to wonder how long it's gonna take before that seeps into the law. 
Um, the Supreme Court has been had a very expansive view of the First Amendment for the past couple of decades um, and has refused to carve out, for example, uh, hate speech as an exception to the First Amendment, most recently in a 9-0 decision in Mittal v. Tam. So it's hard to say, you know, I do worry, but at the same time, I have seen things get a little bit better in the past couple of years. Um, 2017 was kind of the worst year. It's the year you had the Milo Yiannopoulos event at Berkeley. It's the year when uh, uh, Charles Murray was set to speak at Middlebury uh, and, and he and his interlocutor were, were attacked. So, but it's, it's hard to say. I wish I had a stronger answer for you. Yep. Yeah, uh, well, there are a couple of universities that already include kind of free expression as a as a module within their orientation program. So I would encourage uh, administrators to look towards those examples. Uh, Purdue is one that has orientation programming surrounding free expression. Uh, Princeton is another that has had it. I don't know if it's a regular recurring module. Uh, University of Chicago also has it. University of Chicago has a new president who just issued one of the best letters to the campus community at the start of the school year on free expression that I've ever read uh, and spoke about some of the orientation programming. Um, campus reads are, are a good idea. And FIRE actually has orientation program module that's free for colleges and universities to use if they so wish uh, that we'd be happy to turn over. It talks about things like what are my uh, rights at a public school? Uh, what are my rights at a private school? What, is it, what does academic freedom mean? Oftentimes that's a clouded and confused term. Um, so we're always happy to share those with administrators as well. Hi. Yeah. Which I think related to social media would probably probably mean a pretty critical uh, perspective on content moderation. Mm -hmm. But then when when I and I think it's it's, it's generational because if there's no content moderation or if there's no state regulation of this non social media, it's still not that I just get to decide for myself what to do, right? Like um, the playing field within society is just not evened out there mm -hmm. and the these um uh the these oh that's better <laughs> and the i could hear you before i promise perfect <laughs> and the dissimilarities um because just of the like social status and discrimination and these kind of things can also have a very harming effect on who is actually able to participate in a discussion mm -hmm. without some kind of a moderating um, function. So this is kind of a contradiction that I'm trying to um, yeah, get more understanding of. So if you have a position on that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I'm glad someone asked about social media. There's a lot of different rabbit holes I could go, go down. Uh, you know, when it, often when we're talking about free expression, we're talking about government censorship, right? Uh, and that's sort of the worst form of censorship because they have a monopoly on the use of force. Uh, and we've seen what government censorship could do over time. Uh, but there are censor, there is quote unquote censorship in other contexts, uh, particularly with private actors like social media. I mean, this is for all intents and purposes become a sort of town square where we debate the ideas, uh, debate ideas with each other. But they're also private platforms which have the ability through their community standards to determine who gets to speak um, and in what way. And there are no great answers in that context, right? Because you don't want the government to come in and say, no, you have to allow all speakers essentially to socialize uh, uh, social media platforms um, and say, you have to let all speakers speak. And I, I ultimately just don't think by the nature of the internet, anyone really wants to see that on social media. It, if you applied First Amendment standards to social media, you'd see a lot of pornography, 
a lot of beheading videos, a lot of crush videos. Um, but we at FIRE think kind of the core of the ethos of free expression is a rejection of viewpoint discrimination, right? Particularly around political uh, and social debate. Uh, and unfortunately, what you've seen for the past couple of years is a lot of viewpoint discrimination, a lot of deplatforming of speakers on these platforms because they hold a minority ideological view or a minority political view. Uh, and that's a problem, right? We've heard the phrase Twitter isn't the real world before. Well, you have to wonder if it's not the real world because all the people who would be reflective of the real world get booted off of it. Has anyone, has anyone seen uh, This Place Rules, the HBO documentary? Andrew Callahan, I see, yeah, one hand goes up. Andrew Callahan is essentially in this documentary, and I recommend this documentary to everyone, sort of uh, tracks or documents over the past couple of years, kind of the ideological stream, extremes in America and the polarization that exists. And, and in talking about uh, particularly the far right, he says, here you have a bunch of people who believe there's this deep state's conspiracy to silence them and their followers. And then you have social media companies come in and silence them and their followers. You know, what's, the, what's that do, right? It just supercharges the polarization. Um, and so FIRE has long argued that, you know, there's a difference between content moderation and viewpoint uh, discrimination. And to the extent that certain platforms don't want buckets of content, that would otherwise be protected by the First Amendment on their platform. That's one thing. Pornography, crush videos, beheading videos. To the extent you allow political debate on your platform, to have a culture of free expression, to have a platform, as Twitter says, which is it's a public square that is reflective of the actual public, you shouldn't engage uh, in viewpoint discrimination. Now, that's not the only issue with social media. I could spend the rest of this time we have this room talking about social media. You also have uh, issues with misinformation and disinformation. Uh, misinformation um, often gets confused with disinformation. Disinformation is the deliberate propagation of falsehoods in order to kind of shape a narrative or undercut a debate. Misinformation is just untruths, right? Lies that are not, or, or what we see now, as lies, which are just not true and aren't propagated for any sort of malicious reason. Uh, we saw a lot of content taken down during the current 19 pandemic for being misinformation that a couple of months later, we learned the science says actually isn't misinformation. We, we, sh we should have a, a somewhat wide berth for people to get things wrong or to have a dissenting opinion on important political or scientific topics. Uh, disinformation is a little bit more malicious, right? And it's, can, it's, it's hard for a free speech advocate because if you, if you believe in the small t truth argument for freedom of expression, the informational theory of free expression, that is, it's important to know the world as it is. Disinformation has a way of undercutting that because it floods the zone with bullshit um, and shapes the public conversation in a way that isn't really reflective of the actual public conversation. Bots, right? for example. This is what Russia has done within its borders for years. I, I highly recommend if you haven't read the book, uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible by Peter Pomerantsev. He talks about how in Russia, they, everyone is just uh, in a continuous state of cynicism because they're completely flooded with bullshit and they don't know what to believe. And so they don't believe anything, right? You can see a situation like that through bots and uh, efforts at disinformation on the internet uh, where you kind of get into that sort of situation. So it's hard to navigate. It's a great question. Um, so I could, I could keep going on there, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop and maybe we could have a conversation afterwards as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I mean, you said you were going to stop there, but my question is actually related to that. And so I'll ask you to double down, which is, of course, um, within the regulatory space internationally, we see that there are certain countries that want to enact social media regulations that go a great deal further than other yeah. countries. We think about European Union countries with extensive hate speech laws, and that those can be used to control and coerce platforms through heavy fines and things like this. And in some sense, therefore, they, again, they can lower the bar for everybody on free speech. Yeah. And so how does FIRE recommend that, uh, again, uh, social media platforms handle this, that individuals uh, uh, interact with this? And relatedly, does FIRE take any position on Section 230 reform? 
Yeah, well, we're supportive of Section 230. We don't want to change it. Um, I, could, I could go down that rabbit hole too, if you'd like. It would, it, depending on how, on how they would reform or change 230, um, there is a serious threat to just kind of the nature of the internet. They do it that way. But I'll address your question about, about Europe. Um, yes, there is a serious concern uh, in our globalized economy. If a big market like Europe decides that it is going to require social media platforms or internet platforms to restrict speech uh, in a way that go beyond what a lot of these platforms have already established in the, through their terms of service, uh, you know, it could have an effect of just lowering the ball bar all across the world, right? Unless you wanted to create um, unique platforms for each continent or each country. Um, we just wrote an op-ed in the LA Times, one of our senior fellows, Yaka Mushingama, uh, wrote about this exact problem. Uh, and I would recommend folks check it out. I don't know that we have a good solution for it right now, other than to say, um, you know, to the extent that these social media platforms or internet platforms are committed to the values that we have here in America, free speech and open inquiry, uh, that they might consider just leaving those markets or threatening to leave those markets altogether. Uh, they're profit sinking enterprises, so I doubt that they would do that, uh, right? But we've seen some internet platforms do exactly that. Uh, there's a new kind of YouTube competitor called Rumble that has left the French market because it didn't want to abide by what it saw as overly restrictive French laws. We've seen folks leave the Chinese market because they didn't want to uh, abide by Chinese laws. But you're seeing increasingly countries abroad try and control the information ecosphere here in the United States. You see China do this all the time. You see it do it on college campuses and private companies. Just look at what happened to Daryl Morey, uh, who is now the vice president of operations over at the 76ers when he spoke out in support of the Hong Kong protesters and was condemned by LeBron James and other folks. Uh, or Inez Cantor Freedom, who's, who played for the Celtics uh, and China retaliated when he came out in support of the Hong Kong protesters by banning Celtics games in China. Uh, and as claims that he was ousted from the NBA as a result of his, his activism. Um, so it's a problem, uh, you know, globalism has many benefits, but it all has also many complications that it creates, uh, not just for free expression, but for other issues as well. Good evening. Uh, thank you for visiting Cornell. I had a question. Do you view freedom of speech as something that rises in other countries on its own or something that we should, as America, stimulate in those countries, perhaps in interfering in their affairs, etc.? And if it's the former, um, um, how would you go about establishing the practice of free speech in the countries that have long tradition of censorship, for example? And, um, also, uh, what is your view on um, freedom of speech in the time of crisis uh, during the wars as we uh, see uh, it unravels right now in Europe, um, in particular Ukraine? I, uh, should Ukraine essentially take uh, extreme pro-free speech and unban the uh, Russian propaganda outlets? Um, how, 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 how the practice of the censorship should be changed in the countries that it's not as developed as in the United States? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think the United States is unique in that it's the protections for freedom of ex expression here are stronger than they are uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, but freedom of expression wasn't created in America. The philosophy that undergirds it um, was, was often uh, practice in countries uh, that in some cases no longer exist, right? All over the world, um, people understood the benefits of free and open inquiry. Um, do I think the United States should, you know, violate country sovereignty? Uh, no, and I don't think that's what you're suggesting by trying to enforce uh, kind of our values on them. No, but I think we should do what free expression predisposes, which is make the arguments, right? make the arguments for why uh, in a free democratic society, these values are important and, and hope that, that they carry weight uh, and that there are people on the ground ultimately who have a say in those democratic processes who are willing to, to push for them. I mean, we see what the lack of freedom of expression looks like in many countries. We see what it means when 
in Russia, you're holding up blank signs because you can't write any words on the signs uh, to express your opinion. Uh, and you still get arrested for doing that. <laughs> Even in England, when the queen died, uh, someone held up a sign protesting the monarchy and they were arrested for doing that. This, these are things that could not happen in the United States. And if they did happen, we'd, we'd sue the government over it and we'd have pretty good recourse uh, to do so. Remind me what the second part of your question was. Um, so in terms of, uh, in times of crises, essentially. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, crises are a civil libertarian's worst nightmare, right? Who was it, Rahm Emanuel, who once said, you know, always make use of a crisis. Um, when you're in the thick of a crisis, you always think that's the time where you need to uh, limit civil liberties. But that's, at the, that's the time when civil liberties are most under threat and when civil libertarians need to stand up for the values. I mean, these, this is the argument that jailed anti-war protesters during World War I, that jailed anti-war protesters uh, during the Vietnam War. We're in crisis, right? Uh, we can't have people undercutting uh, the country's morale or war effort. Um, you even saw this uh, a little bit uh, during COVID-19, right? Uh, preventing the exercise of free expression, um, protests uh, on social media platforms, all being private, you know, using the COVID-19 pandemic as a new excuse to, to uh, put it, implement policies that would prevent users from speaking out uh, about the issues. So yeah, crises are very dangerous and I would warn against ever using a crisis, crisis to censor. Even Russian propaganda, it's slippery slope. Thank you for speaking. Uh, obviously, I, I sort of missed the, the first part of your talk, so I apologize if you oh, sort of okay. covered it before. Um, but I'm really interested in, I guess, sort of, you know, one of the other fine lines uh, in terms of, you know, free speech, uh, that being obscenity. Um, and right there's, you know, the, the famous line, you know, you'll know it when you see it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that obviously ends up being sort of, you know, a very troubling um, kind of, you know, tests uh, to, to implement and things, but some of the, the books that you sort of mentioned that were being banned on a number of states and sort of actions taken by a lot of legislators to, as you say, and as Fire said, sort of to restrict speech, um, a lot of their arguments are based on obscenity. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you could, I guess, sort of expound uh, a little bit more uh, upon your opinions on sort of that line with obscenity and what do you think uh, the, the future uh, direction is um, for that sort of, you know, First Amendment jurisprudence? Yeah, well, I mean, obscenity, as, as I'm sure you know, just based on how articulate your question was, is, is kind of a doctrine that has gone by the wayside, right? It's, um, you're often not seeing in society writ large, so sort of obscenity arguments for re restricting for restricting speech in, in the middle part of the century is often surrounding pornography, but pornography now is uh, proliferate. You know, I think uh, porn websites are the top websites on the internet and uh, uh, there, are, there aren't really efforts to try and censor them anymore. Um, but in different, you know, in different contexts, such as school libraries, um, there is the question of age appropriateness and you could use the word obscenity, but um, you know, age appropriateness is something that is often determined and, and arguably should be determined by school boards and, and librarians in consultation with each other. So one of the books that is, is often um, challenged is a book called Gender Queer, which, which features a, a photograph of um, someone wearing a strap-on dildo uh, getting fellatioed. Um, there is a serious argument of whether that belongs in a middle school library, for example. Uh, but my argument would be that it should be determined through the processes that are already established for what is age appropriate, right? Um, and if you don't trust the processes, well, then you should maybe through the democratic process uh, change the processes. Again, we have compulsory K through 12 education. We've established school boards and a democratic process to determine you know, how our children are educated. Uh, and you can use those processes uh, as well. That was one of the books, by the way, that was sought to be banned from being sold in the state of Virginia. Now that's an entirely different question. That book should be available for people who wish to purchase it. Um, but obscenity is kind of, it's, it's not quite um, like a f the fighting words doctrine uh, or in that it just doesn't get enforced very much anymore, but it, it sort of is in that kind of sphere of First Amendment exception separate from the sort of like true threats and defamation law or incitement to imminent lawless action, which there's kind of robust litigation surrounding. Yeah, it was a good question. Thank you. 
Hello. So I have a question about more of an up and coming and more popular field that keeps developing, like AI and deep fakes. Yeah. Do you think that that will, over time, as it continues to advance, contribute to more like spreading of misinformation? And do you think we need to limit those technologies or anything? Or what, what is your take on AI developed things and deep fakes and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. It's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And I don't know that I have a certain... Uh, uh, a strong answer for you, yet I can just kind of take my thinking where it goes. Uh, Bob mentioned, I host a podcast. I've hosted a podcast on free expression issues for the past seven years called, so to speak, the free speech podcast. And my last podcast was about AI and free speech and first amendment issues. And it featured uh, Eugene Volokh. Is anyone here uh, uh, in the law school? Yeah, okay. Eugene, you might be familiar with Eugene Volokh. He uh, is a UCLA law professor, first amendment scholar, uh, Volokh conspiracy. I did it with him and uh, Allison Sherry, a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, and uh, David Green, who's uh, the Civil Liberties Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We talked about these issues, right? So the interesting thing about deepfakes, is anyone not familiar with what deepfakes are? It's a sort of... So uh, there's this video going around on social media right now of Morgan Freeman talking about artificial intelligence, and it looks like Morgan Freeman. And it sounds like Morgan Freeman, but it's not Morgan Freeman. It's someone emulating his voice and taking his likeness uh, to kind of speak in front of the camera. If you just type in Morgan Freeman uh, deep fake, you'll know exactly, what, you'll find it. It'll become up in the search results. And so there is a concern, right? Like this is a serious concern, right? Let's say you have Joe Biden, you deep fake Joe Biden, you can have a war of the world, H.E. Wells war of the world situation where he announces that a nuclear bomb is headed our way and everyone needs to see shelter. Um, I'm deeply concerned about that. Um, and, I, and I do think we have laws in place that would address that. But would it be too late by the time it gets addressed, right? You need to know it's a deep fake in order to um, level a fraud or misrepresentation charge, right? Um, fortunately, deep fake detecting technologies have thus far, to my knowledge, kept up with deep fake technologies. But we've seen how it how fast AI technology has advanced just in the past couple of weeks. Um, so how long, I mean, it's already passed the Turing test. I, I can already not tell a deep fake. You need technology to be able to detect it. But I am seriously concerned about that. And I don't know that a deep fake that holds itself out to represent the words and likeness of someone else would um, pass First Amendment muster. If that makes sense. Thank you. All right, since no one's in line, I have a question of my own. Um, there, there are some people who will take free speech as a license to just go out and say anything mm -hmm. and say, you know, either misinformation, disinformation, uh, outright lies, or just scandalous things to rile people up and get popularity. Yeah. Uh, how best to address that? And can you speak to the duty that we have as uh, free speakers to speak truthfully and in a way that's not going to hurt other people? Yeah, well, it's, well it's, a, it's a good question, right? Um, you know, to the extent that people are exercising their rights within the scope of their rights, um, we need to protect their ability to do so. Sometimes that means protecting the rights of people who speak at the margins. Sometimes it means protecting the rights who, of people who lie or speak untruths. I mean, the Supreme Court had a, had a case known as the Stolen Valor case where someone held out that they were a Medal of Honor recipient when they were protected speech. It's not unlawful uh, in many contexts, although in some it is to lie. Um, it's not unlawful to say stupid things. We'll do that all the time, right? But the, the correct answer is more speech, uh, not censorship. Um, sometimes that's difficult, but it's the trade-off that you, you have to make in a free society for a free society to remain a free society. Um, you know, one day's blithering idiot might be the next day's genius. You know, I, there, there is a uh, open letter uh, from the early part of the 20th century condemning uh, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Um, uh, just so happened to be correct, although there's some quantum theory has, has some clues with it, but uh, uh, you know, you just never know what, what's going to be true, what's going to be false. So the answer is more speech, not censorship. We come to a greater conception of the truth through speaking now.
Anyone else? All right, okay. Then. That looks well, like thank it. Thank you all for listening today and uh, we'll wrap it up another.